This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi. Welcome to A Conversation with Dave Brown. It's my pleasure to be your host. I'm Tom Preston Giacomo. Um, uh, born in Trenton, Tennessee, in a career that lasted over 50 years, Dave Brown has gone through radio and television and endeared himself to people in Memphis and throughout West Tennessee, not just with his weather forecast, but the humanity that comes with the man. This guy has a superpower. Dave Brown can make milk and bread disappear from the shelves of Kroger or Cecil's <laughs> like, like nobody else. Dave, it's good to have you here. Your weather Thank projections you. made people uh, aware and made them just run out and prepare. Two comments about that. One, I, I, how many people actually eat milk sandwiches? Yeah. <laughs> and, and the second is, uh, you, you mentioned Cecil's back in the right. day. Well, I got, uh, we, we had a big seven inch snow, which I had correctly predicted right. the night before. And I went out in the lobby that afternoon. Somebody said, there's, there's uh, somebody has brought something by for you. And there's this huge vase of red roses. Right. And I said, wow, I was open the card and it said, thanks, Art Cecil. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful way to go? Though? I mean, it for, is. for you to, and let's start with Trenton, Tennessee. Let's All just right. take it from the very basics. You grew up, how big was Trenton? 5,000 people, roughly. Okay. Uh, small town, county seat of Gibson County up in northwest Tennessee. Wonderful town. I still have a home there today. I go up uh, every chance I get. Excellent. And um, it's just an incredible town. Uh, it, it was a great Village. That, that's something it, that came into politics from a few the years it takes ago, a village. from the it takes a village type thing. Well, that's kind of what that town was. Everybody knew everybody else. You didn't dare misbehave down the street because they would tell your mom before right. you got home. And uh, it, it was just a very warm, loving place. Still is that way a, a great deal of the way. Also, it made it even more special. My dad died of a brain tumor when I was 10 years old. Uh, he and my mom both well loved and respected in that town and the people just put their arms around us and uh, the, that great support and also the fact that my dad was a great guy and had so many good friends even though he was gone it was almost like my dad was still there I as I was growing up so it uh, it's a great town I love it today and in a conversation we had you said that you started to work when you were 10 is that about right Fit, well I started to work when I was 10 yeah right. uh, with a paper route yeah, I, I. So you've been in media all your life. Well, I, yeah, <laughs> sort of. I did take one brief time out. I thought my dad, had, when he was so sick, we spent a lot of time at the pharmacy because he was on so many medications. Right. And uh, so I decided at one point I wanted to be a pharmacist, right. and that's probably what I would have, have pursued. Uh, but then, at age fifteen, radio. Fifteen, and, and how did that happen? You know, I mean. Well, I fell in love with two things about age twelve: Memphis and radio music. Okay. Now, I didn't realize how closely the two were connected at that age, but uh, um, I loved listening to the radio, loved listening to, to rock and roll on the radio. So what were your stations when you were growing up before you worked at your first station? WHBQ oh, in excellent. Memphis. And at night, we couldn't get it because they had to cut their power to protect the signal, a clear channel station out of Miami on the same frequency. So at night, WLS Chicago came roaring in. So those were the two, WHBQ in the day, WLS at night. And your first job at 15 was at what station? WKBJ in Milan, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I was sophomore in high school, and uh, I, I saw a friend of mine who was working there, and I said, hey, this is great. You get paid for playing records. I play records for nothing at home. <laughs> and I had to get my own sponsors. I think I had six or seven sponsors that I got. Uh, and and they paid for my my show. Right, you were on, on air and in sales. Yeah, that's yeah. just amazing. I, I I would never have been very successful in sales. Oh well, but, uh, but you got enough sponsors to go. So got enough sponsors to go. What songs do you remember playing from that era? What what year? Oh, was it was that 1962. Be? Okay. Uh, and oh, I remember things. I, one I remember in particular. I remember a lot. There was some great music uh, for my money in those days. Right. But one I remember particularly uh, was a song that I thought was terrific because of the drum line in it. It was Sheila by Tommy Rowe. I remember it was that. a number one hit. It hit number one on my birthday, and, and I got to play it on the air on my own show on my birthday. I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. 
Herb Alpert, the Tijuana Brass, the Lonely Bull, one Let's of his first big hits. That's Telstar and Paul and Paula and Telstar, all of yeah, those songs, it, too. You got it. All uh, of those. But, but you left there and then went to another station yeah, in at, another city. After about six, seven months, something like that, I moved 11 miles away to Humboldt, Tennessee. No radio station in my hometown of Trenton at the time. Right. So I, I started in Milan, then moved to Humboldt, and I was over there for about a year and a half. Uh, the interesting thing there, the general manager's uh, brother-in-law was a guy named Jack Parnell. Oh my gosh. Jack, who was one of my heroes at WHBQ. Jack and I got to be friends, and I remember calling him one night, and I said, look, I'm, I'm thinking of going to University of Missouri and study journalism. Right. He said, give it another thought. I said, what do you mean? He said, you should go to Memphis State, and you can major in whatever you want to, and you can work your way through at WHBQ. Oh my. Well, it was like, wow. I, I said, am I good enough to work at WHBQ? He said, yeah, you're good enough. And thanks to him, I was able to do that and work my way through college. So you graduated from high school in, in Humboldt? In Trenton. In Trenton. Mm -hmm. And then you went from Trenton to Memphis. To Memphis. In yeah. 1960, what? I, uh, 1964. And, and you started there. And it's amazing that you carried an air, a full-time air shift, right? Uh, I was part-time at first. Okay. I think about the first year and a half I was part-time. Then I went full-time. So I was going to school full-time in the daytime and working full-time. Were they the, always the on Highland? Yeah, 485 South Highland, where the television station is yeah. now. Yeah. So you, you would balance class and, and your show at the yeah. same time? It was walking distance. Oh. You know, it was a quarter mile. Were, were the co-eds that you met uh, along the way uh, aware that you were a, ri a radio star? Mm, most were not. Okay. No, most of them weren't. Um, a lot of the guys I hung out with were, of course, because they'd want to do something. I said, I can't, i got to go to work. And, okay, so yeah. what were your jobs at WHBQ? What shift did you work? I was a DJ. I, I worked just about every shift except morning drive. Mm -hmm. I never worked morning drive. Uh, we, we had uh, super morning drive guys in Jack Parnell, and then when he became program director, a guy named Skip Wilkerson. I remember Skip. Who was perhaps technically the best DJ as far as mixing that I ever saw. He was terrific. And, and that was after Dewey Phillips then, right? So Dewey well, after had come Dewey. and gone? Yeah, yeah, Dewey had come and gone. I never really heard Dewey on the radio very much. One thing, I was, I was young. I was only eight years old when right. he played the first Elvis record. And, uh, but I knew the history there. Right. But I did see him on TV. You know, he had a show on Channel 13, WHBQ TV, in the right. afternoons for a while. And I saw him on there and thought it was the wildest thing I had ever seen. Is, is that what piques your curiosity, to, to be able to translate radio into television or the possibilities? Not really. I, I don't think I ever really made that much of the connection. Again, I didn't hear him on the radio that right. much, so I, I, I thought it was just something strange. that he, And it was that they right. put on every well, afternoon. Was the radio station and the television station in the same building? Same building, yeah. So did you, how, how did you matriculate from one to the other? Well, I... Uh, I was on the air doing my show one afternoon, and Lance Russell, who was program manager and also the host of the wrestling the show. The Lance Russell. The Lance Russell. Uh, came by and he said, Davey, he said, I, I uh, got a guy who's been helping me out on the wrestling show. He's leaving, and I need somebody to, to help me out. He said, I've, I've been watching you work and, and know a little bit about you and listening to you on the air. And he said, I think you'd be good at it. I'd like you to like you to join me. He said, I don't know if you like wrestling or hate wrestling or where it is, but let me give you some advice. If you ever think you might want to work in television at all, you should take this job because you'll find out if you like television and you'll find out if television likes like you. you. Mm -hmm. I did, thank goodness. And, and who were your first wrestlers? Who did, I mean? Oh, gee, I guess uh, back in the day, Jack, fabulous Jackie Fargo, Tojo Yamamoto, there were a bunch of other guys like that. And of course, Jackie Fargo was getting to the point where his career was, had, had peaked. He wasn't ready to retire, but he had peaked. And he took this kid named Jerry Lawler under his wing. And Jerry went to Treadwell High School. And yeah. Treadwell Eagles, yeah. yeah. And uh, he, he would send in, uh, he's a great cartoonist. And he would send Jerry in, was. Yeah, Jerry Lawler. And he would send in uh, cartoons to Lance uh, of what had happened on the previous week's wrestling. And Lance started showing them on TV, and one thing led to another, and the next thing you know, the king is, is born. Is born, no question yeah. about it. I, I want to talk a lot about wrestling, and, and, and let's come back to that because I'm, I'm, you know, everybody's going to want to hear about that. Yeah. Tell me how you made the transition from wrestling to weather. 
Okay. Um, I, I was doing a wrestling show while I was still working at, at the radio station. And it got to the point where I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I do like this TV thing a little bit. So I was talking to Lance one day, not during the wrestling show. I went to his office and I said, uh, I'm thinking maybe I'd like to try television if you ever have anything open. He said, well, he said, strange you should mention that because come October, uh, I am going to have a, uh, we're going to do dialing for dollars. He said, it's a syndicated thing. We'll need somebody to do it for us and I'll hire him on as a staff announcer. And, um, are you interested in that? And I said, absolutely. So now, we got together on that. Explain the mechanics of dialing for dollars right. for people who watched and tried to win. Yeah. It, uh, we would take the phone book, the, the Memphis. Memphis Metro phone book, and we would cut it up into little slivers. And they would have anywhere from 7 to 10, 12 names on each little piece of paper. Put it in a big barrel, do that, pull a slip out, and the count, say the count was down three. So okay. we start at the top and go down one, two, three. That's the name we're going to call. And you did that on the air? or On the air live. Live. No delay. Isn't that amazing? And so we would call, and if the people first answered the phone. Right. And, uh, and no cell phones in those days. It was all landlines. And then if they knew the count was down three and how much money was in the jackpot. If they knew the count and amount, then they won the jackpot. The count and the amount. Yeah. We gave away a lot of money. That's and just just bought an audience. We were running movies that probably cost the television station five dollars a run, <laughs> and uh, you know spent a little money on, on giving away the jackpot. And it was a real money maker from nine to eleven every morning. I was going to ask how many times in, in that two hour period did you give away money or try to give away money? It would depend. It would depend on the length of the movie. Right. Usually, as I recall, it would be at least three times and sometimes four or five. Uh, sometimes you'd get real short movies in, so I'd need to fill more time to fill the two hours. So we'd just make more calls. Were, were you surprised at the, uh, the people who recognized you from, from the, more so from television than radio? Yes. It's, it's, it uh, was, was quite different. Because on radio, you, you, I never tried to project you know, right. that, you know, you should know me when you see me on the street type right. thing. But on television, it just happens. Right. And uh, it was pretty amazing. And, and that, you, that started when I started doing wrestling. And when you walk into Kroger, people know exactly who you are. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's... But you know the great thing, over the years I've had many people say, I feel like you're a member of my family. You which are. I think is the greatest compliment that anyone could pay me because it says we're comfortable having you in our home. Right. Even only by TV. But, so, but you great. bring valuable information. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how, how weather affects us all. And, True. And, and knowing where it is. Um, let me go back to promotions and, and things like that. Uh, you also took a job for a little while. You did when you were in radio. You were Bill Dance's first audio engineer. Is that correct? Yeah, that's after I'd already moved into television. I came oh. over to television as host of the Dialing for Dollars movie, but my my title was staff announcer. I did not work in the news department. I worked in uh, in programming department. So I was an audio engineer slash staff announcer. So I would run the audio board at various times during the day when I wasn't doing Dialing for Dollars. And uh, Bill had had been to several television stations and he was turned down and he went to Lance Russell and Lance says hey you know this Lance was a fisherman right. and he said uh, hey, you may be onto something here here's what you need to do da 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 and Bill did it so the first ever Bill Dance show I was the guy who was working the audio the opening sound. his microphone Bill and I joke about that to this day were you on location or in a set uh, in the studio oh, it gosh. was all done in studio yeah yeah he would they would in those days it was film there was no digital, no videotape uh, even that was being shot in those days. It was all film. So they would shoot the show on 16 millimeter film and then it would be edited, actually cut and spliced. In house. In house. And wow. then, of course, now he has his own production facility and all sorts of stuff. All right, let's talk about that technology. Are you amazed at the, at the changes that you went through from 16 millimeter developing to yourself with all the chemicals laying around to being able to take out your phone and have just as good a quality now that... that Exactly. A lot of video that goes on uh, local television stations these days, high definition video shot on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's just tremendous. And we can do so much more now. We, we can take people right to what is going on rather than just tell them about it or show them something that happened six, eight hours ago. 
and, and, and it's immediate. Everything is yeah. just, it's right there. You yeah. just plug in and go. Now, not only that, we, we let them know on Twitter and Facebook that we've got it, so to tune right now, and then you've got uh, what's going on. I'm, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna get ahead of myself because I wanna save that for the end of it. You embraced social media faster than anybody else, saw, I think, in the buildings over there. Well, I, I've, I've always kind of been a geek. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's what I was gonna ask you. When, when you did your first weathercast at WHBQ, that was yeah. what year? That was uh, 1972, May of 72. Tell me about your map and okay. everything that was part of that. The map was metal. Okay. It was a, with a map of the United States painted on metal on the, on the wall. And we had the same material. If you go to your refrigerator and look at the back of it, that refrigerator magnet, magnet, that's the same material that we used. And the art department would cut out these pressed board uh, symbols. Clouds and sunshine. Clouds, and cold fronts, highs, lows, all of that. And they would paint them. Uh, appropriately and then put these magnets on the back so we would just stick them on the wall and then we could move them around all we wanted to uh, but that's that's the way it was when I started magnetic I, I, I saw somebody who had like color forms those old plastic things yeah. I worked at a station in Louisville that had some of those yeah after that uh, the uh, uh, computer generation came in the first computers that we had were pretty rudimentary right. first one I had was color right uh, but you couldn't do a whole heck of a lot with it uh, and then it progressed and progressed and progressed, and they're just tremendously sophisticated now. As computing power has gotten better, weather presentation has gotten better, as well as weather forecast. The bigger, more powerful computers, if they can run more and more information in a short period of time, you get better forecast. All right, so you, you came up as a, a baby weather guy. And, and you were there for, what, five years at WHBQ or three years before you came to Channel 5? Well, I was 13 altogether, radio and TV. Okay. I was doing weather there for five years okay. when I came over to Channel 5. The okay. wrestling show got canceled at Channel 13 due to political division in the wrestling company. Okay. And we were owned by a company in New York, and the lawyers in New York said, cancel the whole thing, we're not getting in the middle of that. Wow. Dumbest move they could have possibly made. They had no understanding of the power that that wrestling show had. But it worked out very well for all of us concerned because we went over to Channel 5 and uh, it uh, just who, became legendary there. Who was general manager at that time? Was that Maury Griner? Maury Griner, yeah. Mr. Love Maury Griner. Great uh, guy. And so he brought you guys as a package then? Sort of. He, uh, he brought uh, the wrestling show over and Jerry Jarrett says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hire Lance Russell to help us run the company. He won't work for the television station anymore. Okay. He'll work for us. And he said, I think we can get Dave Brown over here for you too. Well, that was interesting, I found out later on, because they never talked to me about that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it did work out. Channel 5 needed a weather person at the time, and they had Dick Hawley doing double duty. He was doing news and weather, which was becoming not the ideal situation. Right. So they needed somebody to do weather. I was established, so we were able to get together on cash. And were newscasts at that time 15 minutes still, or had no. they expanded to the half hour? They had already expanded the half hour and, and an hour in the early evening. We were at Channel 13, and uh, we were on 6 to 7, and at Channel 5, we were on from 5 to 6 p.m., a solid hour. What, was the format the same at, at WHBQ for wrestling and the same at Channel 5, or did it expand or change? It, it expanded. It grew. It changed. It, it blossomed with uh, the creativity. Uh, you know, it, it, it was fine at Channel 13, and yet it developed there, too, but it really exploded when it got to Channel 5. Were you regional at, at Channel 13? Because when you were at, at no. Channel 5, you had other markets yeah. that these shows ran in, so yeah. maybe the show that you recorded live at Channel 5 would be shown the next week in another market. Say Louisville. Well, I grew yeah. up watching you, and Louisville, I don't want to Kentucky, tell you that. But. Lexington, Louisville, Lexington, Mem uh, uh, Nashville, Jackson, Tennessee. I think we were in six or seven markets, but not at Channel 13. That all happened at Channel 5 when Lance came to work over there. And he, he, that was one thing he did, was, was get us other television stations. At one point, uh, the show was seen in over 60 markets nationwide. Wow. Including places like Atlanta and Kansas City. Now, here's the thing. It wasn't seen at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning, and many of those have seen 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it, it, so it, it didn't pick up a national following. Were they edited? Well, that, well let's, let me go to, in that direction. And there were regional hotbeds for wrestling, right? That, yes. That this kind of program that Lance created was recreated in other markets? Yeah. Or did he get the idea from somebody else and decide to expand it? Here? Well, it was developing in, in, in all across the country. It was territorial. 
in, in those days. The country was divided up into territories. Uh, the, South Car the North Carolina people didn't encroach on, on the Memphis people and vice versa and the Florida people and Louisiana people. So the, con the country was all pretty well divided up with these guys and together they made up the NWA, the National West Wrestling <laughs> Alliance. And that's where that came from. And they would get together and have meetings every so often. And for instance, we would have a guy that was worn out here, basically. Right. He wasn't drawing much anymore because everybody had seen him 25 times. So they'd say, hey, you know, why don't you loan me so-and-so and I'll send him to Florida. They would instance. trade them. We would trade and build audience there. This guy would wear out his welcome. He'd go somewhere else. And Macho Man yeah. Randy Savage comes to uh, mind. And yeah. and those and, and let, let, You tell me the names. I, I don't want to tell you mine. Oh, names. wow, there's so many. All the big names that people heard of in the early days of the WWE, then called the WWF, most of them came through here. Right. Not Andre the Giant and people like that. But, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Randy Macho Man Savage. He came out of, actually, Lexington, Lexington Kentucky. Kentucky. I remember him. And yeah. worked for us. Uh, uh, a guy named Kurt. Angle, who was a star 20 years ago, something like that. He he started here. Uh, Hacks, guy, guy, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Hacksaw Jim Duggan wrestled here. Yeah, uh, the Undertaker. Yep. Uh, several of those guys like that, and uh, a guy named Hulk Hogan. Right. He started here as Terry Bollea, his real name, and uh, I don't believe we ever called him Hulk. I think I think the I, I think it was uh, Terry Hogan maybe or he something like that. Right. But I don't think I don't remember for sure, but I think he became the Hulk when he went to WWE. But he became uh, arguably the biggest wrestling star equal to say a Muhammad Ali right. in the world of boxing. Some some experts called you and Lance Russell working together the greatest wrestling announcer team in history, which is flattering, I'm sure, and and, and, I, and I'm sure you would defer. But but tell me about doing. First of all, you do weather s seven days yeah. a week, of course. If it stormed on Sunday, you came back in, didn't yeah. you? It's, it, you could never do it today. Right. Uh, you would never be allowed to do it today. But for some reason, I just got, I started doing wrestling. And then I started doing weather. And I asked Lance, I said, do I have to give up wrestling? He said, no. Yeah. And for some reason, people accepted the fact that I was giving them weather information, meteorology during the week. And then on Saturday, I was doing this other thing. I think the one thing that may have helped on that, Lance sort of let me develop my own character on That's the, what I on wanted the wrestling to ask. show. Tell Tell, tell me about the, if it's a role, let's call it a role and see. Well, it, it, it was me, but it was also a role. Right. Uh, like in Stephen which, Colbert. Sort of. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, except mine, but my whole thing was I worked for the television station. Therefore, you can't do that because the, that's going to affect negatively on the television station. So that was kind of my role, right. kind of to bring some, uh, just slow it down a little bit and, and bring a little bit of organization to what otherwise was chaos. I got you. And, well, and, and, you, and you were so clean about it. You just, you know, and, and, but you never got, did you ever get punched? No. Okay. No, never did. Lance Closest. got punched, right? Uh, well, not really. Uh, he got pushed around. He right. ripped a pushed suit him. off one day. Right. Dumped, Jimmy Hart dumped flour, a bag of flour over his head. That was a giant mess to clean up. I bet. And let me tell you, I think they gave the cleanup crew $25 extra. And, and Jerry Lawler, or not Jerry Lawler, um, uh, who was the manager? I can't think. Jimmy of Hart. Name. Jimmy Hart called you Dave Brown, the weather clown. Dave Brown, the weather clown. And uh, <laughs> he, he called, uh, Lawler started calling Lance Banana Nose. Right. You know, uh, so I remember that very well. Somehow it stuck. Um, I, I, all the stuff. We've got, we've got about five minutes left to talk. Please talk about your family for a minute. I have a great family. You have a beautiful uh, family. Margaret is a saint. I mean, and she says, "Tell you hello." By the way, she nice. is she is doing uh, great. She is a saint. She's put up with me for all these years. We've been married forty eight years what a schedule uh, as you've of had. this uh, as of this date, uh, and I have three tremendous daughters. Uh, one, of course, I lost in, in the drunk driving crash. A drunk driver killed one of them and her two children. But I also have four wonderful grandchildren today. Uh, they're, they're, either, they're almost grown, but uh, they are just, uh, they, my family is the light of my life, always has been. My daughters uh, that, that are still with us, uh, Denise and Carmen, are something very, very special. And uh, it's 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 been good. It's it's been a month since you've retired. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, are they surprised to have you around the house now? Well, I mean, you know, one thing is sealed the deal. I was talking to Carmen, and I said, "Look, I've decided that I'm going to hang it up at at the end of August." 
and um, I wanted you to know before all of this press release and stuff started going out. I said, we've been talking about this for three years, you know some of that, but I've decided this is going to be it. And she says, great, now I've shared my dad with the rest of the world for 38 years, and now I can have him all to myself. That's excellent. I said, that sealed the deal right there. And with all of these seven-day weeks that you worked for years, for decades, for decades, Dave, you still found time to have hobbies. Um, you're a St. Louis Cards fan. Big, I mean, that, big Cardinals that, fan. Are you, are you going to buy season tickets next year? No. Okay. <laughs> no. But I'm going to see a lot more Grizzlies, Memphis Tigers. Uh, I've already been to a couple of more football games and, and things like that. You're a coin collector, is that correct? Yeah, I, I used to be much more active than I was. started when I was in the eighth grade, a history professor, a uh, uh, history teacher got me hooked on that. I don't have anything very valuable. I just love it for the right. history of it. And the valuable stuff, you don't ever get to play with much because right. you have to keep it in the bank. Yeah, that's, that's a, and, and you're a trainer. Train geek, is that a fair thing to say? Do you, how did you get involved in trains? I'm not sure. Uh, when my dad died, a week after my dad died, there was a giant train wreck on the Gulf Mobile on Ohio Railroad, which ran through Trenton. And uh, after school let out, we only went to school a half day, the final day of school, wow. and my best buddy and I went down and just watched them clean that up all day long. And somehow I became fascinated with railroads and GM and O, and I've got a model layout at my house. And just uh, my grandchildren and I were playing with it a little bit uh, over the weekend. We're inside of two minutes. Is there anything that, that we haven't talked about that you want to mention? Oh, me. Mothers well, Mothers Against Drunk Driving? Maybe? Mothers Against Drunk Driving has become a passion. I just participated in a walk over the weekend to help fundraise there. Uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, I, I am a member of. I don't speak on their behalf, I speak for myself, but I believe in what they're saying. And I think they get a huge amount of the credit for when I started speaking out 18 years ago, 17,000 Americans were dying in drunk driving crashes every year. That number's down to 11,000. That's wonderful. But that's still not near enough. We got a long way to go. And what we've got to do is change society and make it totally unacceptable. We've got things like these ride share programs and the ones you can call on your, right. on your telephone. I think that's going to go a long way. I know some of this younger generation, and that's what they do. They spend the 20 or $30, they go out and have a big time, and they don't worry about hurting themselves or somebody else. And programs like Uber and Lyft are coming along. Exactly what I'm talking about. I, I appreciate you being here. There's, it's been absolutely wonderful to sit across from you, and I wish we had an hour program instead of just this 30 minutes. Always fun to be with you. I remember our great times we had on New Year's Eve. He's Dave Brown, ladies and gentlemen, and you'll find him anywhere he wants to be because he's <laughs> retired now. I'm Tom Presta Giacomo. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Dave Brown. We'll see you again. <laughs>